It's a fascinating thought that we humans are the planet's preeminent learning species. You know, we appear to have brains that can do things that other species can't. In comparison to the ant, we've got miserable muscles. In comparison to the eagle, we can't fly. In comparison to the elephant, we can't do this, that, and the other. Some or other, we seem to have got this most extraordinary brain. Where's this brain come from? How is it that we have brains that other mammals would envy? And it's actually very simple, but it's an extraordinary story. Ever since the time, about four million years ago, we humans started using our brains better than we did, our brains had to get bigger. Now, as our brains got bigger, that put pressure on the skull, and the skull had to get bigger. And this created a real evolutionary potential catastrophe, because every other mammal gives birth to that's young, when their brains are at least 95% fully formed. You know, a calf comes out of a cow ready to run around, a puppy is running around, a kitten does the same thing. But humans, incredibly vulnerable. Why? Well, if women were to carry their babies until their brains were 95% fully formed, pregnancy would last for 27 months. And you know, when I say this at lectures, every woman in the business immediately grins, because it was painful enough at nine months. The reality is that we deliver our babies when they're only 40%, their brains are only 40% formed. And why is that? It's an evolutionary compromise. That's the last moment the baby can get out. But if that's all that happened, that brain would never grow. So there's been something has entered into the human history in the last four million years, which said to compensate for that, we have to grow our brains outside the womb. And that basically means that we've we're, related, we're, we're dependent on our environment. We have to be stimulated by what's going on. So we are inquisitive. We ask good questions. As we ask good questions, that stimulates a whole series of time-limited software in the brain, which actually is sort of coming on stream if the questions are being asked at the right time. If the questions are not being asked at the right time, that time-limited software just disappears. And we understand this in terms of at the very earliest stages, when a mother mother's eyes are bonding with the baby's eyes at the breast, there is a tenfold increase in the synaptic activity that is going on inside the brain. There's no other period in life, as far as we know, when the synapses are firing as quickly as they are when the mother's eyes are bonding with the baby's eyes. That may never happen again. I mean, in lover's eyes, bond with lover's eyes, but it's not doing quite the same thing to the synapses. But the child that doesn't have that starting advantage doesn't have that kickstart to its emotions developing. And it runs right through the first 24, 36 months of life. The child isn't born with its emotions already working. It's born ready to experiment by using the emotions that the adults around it use. So the caring nature of parents for their children produces the caring child. And of course all this ties up with the fact that we now know from other research that children who do best at the age of 18 are the ones who come from homes where there is more dialogue and discussion going on, four times more significant than any other factor. So what does that mean? It means that those windows of opportunity, once opened at the right period, thrive. It even goes on into adolescence, and adolescence is another window of opportunity, which is also dependent on the culture around the outside.